Welcome to Eat Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon. I see Maria Bovens here from Sweden. Welcome to you. Belinda Dahan, welcome to you. Priscilla Kwan, nice to see your name popping in here. I trust you well. All the family's well, Priscilla. Sarah Ray Hughes is watching. Please tell me where you're watching from. Megan Hope, welcome to you. And I see today, Megan, you're giving me a wave instead of a fist bump. But that's okay. I know who Megan Hope is. Um, and as people join in, I will greet you. Uh, somebody else just said, Janine von Skalkweg, Heilet Hiernes. Good afternoon to you. Marriott Wright, nice to see your name as well. Um, do ladies, while we wait for more people to join in, just a little a couple of seconds or minutes. Jennifer Gallard, nice to see you. Um, I hope you know by now about the 10th of December that we're having a ladies day, the last one for the year. I'm very excited about it. It's called The Comeback. So please find it on this page, Kathy Mole Ministries, and you can register free of charge. You can join us by emailing. You'll get all the information on that Facebook event, The Comeback, and we are going to make a comeback together. I found out something interesting today because today I'm speaking about personal revival and I found out something very interesting today while I was looking at notes for the comeback. Um, I was thinking about what I like to do is I like to look up the meanings of words and when I looked up the meaning of revival, which we, we're going to look at some of these meanings today, when I when I found some of the synonyms, not the meaning of revival, the synonyms, which means, I'm sure you know this, but words that are, have a similar meaning to the word you're looking at. And 
one of the words that came up as a synonym for revival is comeback. And so I got so excited about that, and I will share that with you on the 10th of December, not today. But so re revival and comeback, it's a similar thing. It's so interesting. And, and I believe that this is the season that we are in as the body of Christ, that God is reviving us. And, um, whoops, sorry, just got to get my microphone back on properly. God is reviving us, and personal revival always starts with the individual first. God revives us in areas, and today we're going to look at um, we're going to look at some of the signs that you're in the midst of a personal revival, and how can we work together with God, and a couple of different ideas that I've got. And um, so the first thing I want you to think about as we talk about revival is that in anything we do for God, in, uh, whether we're in ministry or not, a, a God is more interested in the messenger, that's you and I, being prepared, available, awakened, walking in intimacy. In other words, a messenger of his message, the kingdom message, it's more valuable to God that we are prepared as people than turning up and having a message that's so well prepared that we forget that we have to be prepared as the messenger. I hope you got what I'm saying there. So um, so I believe God is doing a deep work in all of us in the season so that we are the people who are prepared for what's to come. Not so much what we have to say or do, but as people we are prepared in his presence. That's basically what I'm saying to you. And I see some more people have joined in. To get, uh, Christopher Doran, welcome to you, Christopher. Um, I don't know where you're watching from. Please let me know. Diane Santiago, good to see your name. Cynthia Neves, welcome to you. And Jennifer Gallard, I trust that you are well. It's been a long time since we've seen you. And I know a lot has happened with you. And I trust that you are well in the season and that we're going to see you soon again. I hope you can get there on the 10th. Um, so revival, as I said, always starts with the individual revival. You know, there's a lot of talk about revival, uh, Louisiana, Christopher Doran, welcome to you all the way from Louisiana. Um, so there's a lot of talk about a revival that's coming. The prophets are prophesying. The world is going to see the earth is going to see the greatest revival that the planet has ever seen, and I believe it. I, I just have the sense in my bones that God is, the Holy Spirit is stirring us, and there's an awakening happening. That's what I spoke about last week, awakening, and um, that the Holy Spirit is awakening us in certain areas, and we're going to look at some of those today, so that we can be in line and on time with God's plan. And I do believe we're going to see revival, but when we think about revival, we think about what we heard about before, you know, big tent meetings with lots of healings and signs and wonders and and God moving, and, and I hope it's that. I want to see that. But um, this is what the meaning of the word revival is. If we talk about revival starting with you and I, because we're talking about personal revival, and this is what the, the definition of the word revival is, an improvement improvement in the condition, strength, or fortunes of someone or something. Now, this is a dictionary definition. This is not a, the Greek or Hebrew. So it's an improvement in the condition, strength, or fortunes. In fortunes doesn't mean your money. Maybe it does, but the no, you know, I've got a fortune in the bank. Your fortunes means your well-being of someone or something, your welfare or your well-being. It also means an instance of something becoming popular, active or important again. Isn't that interesting? Revival. Something becoming popular, active or important that once was popular, once was active in your life, once was important and it's going to become important or active again. Now this is the biblical definition of awakening. An awakening in a ch of revival. An awakening in a church or community of interest and care for matters relating to personal religion. Now, that is the biblical definition. Now, we know that revival in our lives means that God is, he's got his hand on us. He is waking us up to something. He's speaking to us. He's, we're becoming aware of him and what he's doing. 
and this is what I believe is happening worldwide in the body of Christ, that we, we are becoming so aware of the importance of His presence, the importance of being Holy Spirit-led people, so we can stay on track with what He's doing. Now, the synonyms for revival, the similar words for revival, I already said one of them is come back, but it also means recovery, restoration, and resurrection. So maybe in your life, for a certain amount of time, you have been feeling that oh, your prayer life's become boring. Your study of the word is just humdrum and dry. You're getting nothing out of it. You don't feel like going to church anymore. There's no excitement, I'm saying, for a while. But then something began to change. And there's this, this enthusiasm for the things of God again. There's this hunger because... And uh, a recognition that we need the presence of God is always the, the precursor to revival. When God's people begin to recognize we need the presence of God, we've been going through the motions. And I believe many churches are in this place where because we've got to the end of the old season and God wants to do something different, we all say, God, we something has to change you. We're tired of going through the motions. We need your life. And that is always the precursor to revival because when we get to that place as individuals or churches, and last week I spoke about nations that I saw, I remember as I was speaking online about awakening, that I saw prophetic promises that had been spoken over nations over decades and even centuries and that these prophetic promises were still there with the with the the uh, all the potential for those things to come forth and the nations were like seed beds you know if you if you are into growing plants and vegetables and things from seeds then you you create the seed bed and you put the seeds in there and you've got to watch over it and water it and and feed it and then the seeds begin to grow and they become what that this, the, the DNA of the seed contains. And I saw this as I was speaking last week about awakening, that all the promises are sitting in the nations, waiting for God's people to get into agreement with those promises where the enemy has come and tried to cover them up with soil, and we're never going to see those things. And so God, by His Spirit, is beginning to stir His people to pray over those seeds so those seeds can begin to grow into what they were meant to be and every nation has a prophetic purpose and so prayer first a recognition a hunger for the presence of God and a recognition that we need God are the, the precursors to revival but prayer is the biggest key to revival if when it wherever I have read about previous revivals that it all it always started with people praying, whether they were a few old ladies like the Hebrides revival, a church gathering together to pray, an individual praying. Our prayers as believers are powerful. And it's in this season where, um, where God wants to release something fresh and something new that you're going to sense in your own life a desire to pray more. And then you come to God and you say, I know I need to pray more. And it's not the old humdrum prayer life that you used to because the Spirit of God is breathing on, on our prayers in the season because God wants to do what He promised. So we come to God and we say, God, um, you know, you're going to find yourself praying in, in tongues, in your Holy Spirit heavenly language, praying the mysteries of heaven, the secrets of heaven, that, that get straight to the heart of God so God can do something. Because when you pray in your heavenly language, you're praying what the Spirit knows is in the heart of the Father already. And so your prayer life is going to go from, you know, just here and, oh, I'm just going to get by and go to God with my list every day. And you, if you are willing and available and you say, Holy Spirit, come and pray through me, I want to pray revival prayers you're going to recognize that you are praying things on a whole new level. And when we pray according to God's heart, because the Spirit of God is telling us how to pray, then there's the authority, the backing, and we become spiritual snipers. And we, we're praying according to God's will. And then those seeds are going to begin to grow, burst through the soil. So this is what I felt God said. And this statement I'm going to say to you now 
is why I'm speaking about this today. And I believe you are these people. The enemy has tried to stop the birthing of a new season. The enemy has tried everything, sending darkness and chaos and confusion and sickness and everything that is not the kingdom, everything opposite to the kingdom of God. The enemy has, has thrown it. Um, and, and it's because the enemy is trying to stop the birthing of a new season. But the one thing the enemy has forgotten is that Jesus gave his people abundant life. John 10.10, 10. it's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and life in abundance, John 10.10. 10. And that means that God quality and quantity of life. You know, the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. And so God wants us to live with a revelation of that's my life, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And there's a remnant rising up who believe abundant life is ours. Not this, what the enemy's trying to throw at us to stop the birthing of a new season. Because when the enemy keeps throwing at you confusion, discouragement, disappointment, reminding you of past seasons, the hardships and all of those things, then you're going to forget John 10.10. 10. But there's a remnant rising up who say, we believe that this abundant life is what is our inheritance in Christ. And we are going to live these lives in spite of our circumstances because the kingdom of God is within us and God wants you and I to be people who, who are going to be people who pray that his kingdom comes to earth, his will on earth as it is in heaven. And he's activating you and I in this season. I really believe it. He's activating his bride in this season to be effective in his kingdom. And so if you will just say, God, I'm available. I want to be a spiritual, um, a spiritual. I want to be a new wineskin. I want to be available to be spirit led and to pray what you need me to pray. Because I believe that abundant life is mine. And you know that abundant life is not just getting by every day and surviving every day. Abundant life is kingdom living. And it's, I don't care what my circumstances look like, but I believe what God said. And I have abundant life in the season. Devil, I don't care what, what the pictures that you're showing me, the what if this doesn't happen, the maybe this will fail. Why, why should you trust God? It didn't work for you before or for anybody else. Why are you doing this? And we say, but Jesus came to give us abundant life. And we're going to take that in the season. And this is how we are going to be people who, who, who say, there's revival coming. We're going to get into agreement with what the word that's going out. Um, there's, a, there's an outpouring of revival and the Spirit of God upon God's people because God's will will be done. God's way will be seen on the earth and we're going to be part of this. So when we talk about personal revival, God declares a new season. You may have heard it. Somebody else said it, but maybe... Um, you haven't heard a personal word about revival. You take that word. You say, God, I want revival in my own life. And so we're going to look at a couple of things about uh, things I've looked at in my own life that I believe can help you as well. So religion is one of the biggest enemies in every new season. Every new thing God wanted to do, there was always this religion that that um, it's a spirit. It's a a demonic thing and, and an enemy that gets into the mindset of people because religion will attack anything to do with revival because revival is when God comes and restores and reawakens and begins to show us new things and religion will say but that's not how it's supposed to be this is how you're supposed to behave this is how God does something and it's always in the box and contained and restricted and God's saying, but I want to do something new. And so religious thinking will keep us in a place saying, I'll wait until one day when God does it. And um, thinking that comes out of relationship and believing that abundant life is our inheritance in Christ is going to say, God, speak to me. I don't care what I have to do. I need the life of God. And um, it doesn't mean you have to be all weird and jerk and shake every time you go to church and you know, do and say strange things just to be out of the box. 
It just means you have the life of the Spirit in operation in your life. And that breaks off re any religious thinking because religious thinking comes because of a lack of revelation. Religious thinking is going to say there's never anything new because when there's something new that God does, if any leader is insecure, if any church is insecure, if any individual is insecure, they're going to have the sense of, I've, you know, I've got to keep this under control. I can't let go of what I know. I've got to stay in the, in the familiar zone. And I can't let go and receive what God has for me because then I will have no say over how it's going to happen. And then, so this is religion. Religion keeps people like this. And this is what people should look like. This is what people should wear. These are all obvious signs of religion. But when it comes to God doing something new, religion is a big thing. No, rather stay where you are, because once you get into a new season, you're not going to know what to do. People are saying you've got to step out in faith, but what if you fail? This is all religion trying to keep you in the box. This is what you know, rather stick to what you know. Um, also, religion um, will make people question the new by saying to them, you are irrelevant. This whole sense of being insecure in in your ministry, yourself as an individual, your calling, your future. And here God says, I'm going to do something new. And there's the sense of, am I relevant enough to go into the new? Okay, so, so recognize that all of these things are the enemy trying to stop you from stepping into revival in your life. So God declares this new season, but we have to cooperate with the Spirit. And one of the things that, that I feel God does with me regularly is I go back to the beginnings. I go back to, I start to think about, and it's not that I have to stop doing everything I'm doing. It's an attitude of heart. It's giving God time just to remember. And when I do this, I it's like I begin to remember. I recognize the busyness in my life that has crept in and caused a whole lot of clutter around me that I have to remove, and it, it sort of um, presses into my relationship with God, and my life becomes a lot of doing things. And when I recognize this, I always recognize that God has more for me, and the busyness and the distractions are trying to rob me of the more that God has for me. So what I do is I go back to the beginnings, and I go back to what I call old school. And there can be no revival unless we, we go back to old school. And when I say old school, now I'm older, probably older than a lot of you watching or listening to me today. Rory and myself, Rory's my husband, if you didn't know, have been in ministry together for over 30 years. And um, it's about 33 years this year. And I know it's not a long time. A lot of people have been in ministry for much longer than us, but we've learned a lot. But also, we regularly have to go back and remember the old school. Now, I'm not saying we have to do things the old way, but when I say it's considered old school to go back to the beginnings and remember how I felt when I first got to know the Lord. These are basic things. If you want revival, you've got to be prepared to go back to basics. And so there's a place that I remember. I, of course, I remember because it's a little church where, where I lived with my parents when I was growing up, where I got to know the Lord for the first time, where I got saved. And um, I remember how I felt that night. And I was about 14. I remember because it was, I had an encounter with God. And I remember rushing home to tell my parents that I had got saved. I was born again. And, um, you know, I just remember that. And, and also the simplicity of faith that I had in those days. And even maybe, maybe not when I was 14, but even as I got older, when Rory and I went into ministry, the simplicity of faith is so important because over time we begin to just complicate things. And then we get all these strategies and these things we learn from other people. And, and, and we need to live in a simplicity of faith that makes our faith powerful because God is not complicated. He's powerful. And we walk in, in, the, in the, you know, the awe and the fear of God. We want to please Him. But he's not complicated. And then the other thing is that this childlike expectation that, that I had. I would go to God and I would ask for big things. I remember when I was 14 or 15, 
I said to God, God, I want to go to the nations. And, and I was living at home with my parents, obviously. I was still at school. But I never saw any scope to travel anywhere. I wasn't part of a family that had a whole lot of money. And we would go on these, you know, these trips overseas in the holidays. Our trips were like get all, all of us bundling into my father's car and we would drive to Paul. And to me, when I was that age, that was a big thing. We would, I remember my mother would get so excited because we were going away for 10 days and it was like a big excursion. It felt like it took us two hours to get there. Now we jump in the car and we're in Paul in an, you know, an hour, 45 minutes. But the, the childlike expectation when I would go to God and I would say, God, I, I want to go to the nations. And I know God spoke to me back then. But I had this in my heart. And you know what happens over time when you become so busy and distracted and you're doing the right stuff. You're fighting the good fight of faith. You're putting on the armor. You're standing, being strong in the Lord. And you're preparing your messages. And you're praying. You know, doing all the right stuff. But even in all of that, we lose our childlike faith, the simplicity of faith. And we also we lose the passion of worship. And I'm not talking about going to worship God in church on a Sunday morning. I'm talking about just living a lifestyle of worship, that it's all about Him. It's, it's laying down my will and my wants for what He wants for me. That is worship. So in this season, um, and you know, when I say the old school, it's like I, I just remember um, going to church in the early days, and, and, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen now. You know, but, but in the busyness of life and in the fighting the good fight of faith, it's like we lose that simplicity. And so I just remember going to church. I could not wait for Sundays to go to church. I could not wait for Wednesdays to go to the midweek meeting. We would be at the 5.30 a.m. prayer meetings and, and all of those things. And I believe God is going to re-energize resurrect those areas in your life that you know you can recognize that oh, I'm not that passionate about those things anymore maybe for you maybe something different but I've recognized in my life the thing about prayer the importance for prayer um, is that when I pray God listens and even that becomes a cliche but it's got to become real in our lives because as I said last week and I said just now Prayer is the key to revival, and God is awakening us. The Holy Spirit is stirring God's people to pray, because prayer is what gets things done. We can sit back and say, God knows all about it. God said there's going to be revival, but He needs our cooperation, and we can't make revival happen. We can't make anything happen uh, in these great plans that God has for His church. The only thing we can do is pray. And then as we pray, we begin to see the power because we're totally trusting the Holy Spirit to show us how to pray. So in this season, I believe that it's important that you and I learn to obey the inner promptings of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is going to lead you and He's going to show you what to pick up and what to lay down. He's going to show you what to say, where to be, and to recognize where the favor is for you to be in the season because... There's a place that God has for you in a season of revival or even preparation for revival. And especially in preparation for revival, there's a place that God has for you, which is where his abundant life is going to be seen. And it's not always going to be struggle and people again, coming against you and warfare and all of this. You're going to step into a season of abundance so you can be effective for him in the season. And you can pray effective, fervent prayers. You know, fervent prayers, prayers that reach the boiling point, prayers with passion, uh, prayers of passion. And so we've got to stay in the place that God has for us now and um, so that we can be in that flow, that's, that stream, that river of favor and abundance so that we can be effective. So the Holy Spirit is, is going to begin to prompt you and tell you to go somewhere, be somewhere, pray this, read this, watch this, do this. Um, and we have to learn to be obedient to those inner promptings of the Spirit of God. Such an important thing to recognize. When God is saying, stay at home and pray, you stay at home and pray. Uh, don't stay home from work and say, God told me to stay home and pray. I'm not saying that at all. 
So the Holy Spirit is stirring things in us. And what happens is when we pray, um, the, the word gets activated. And then the seeds begin to, to come forth. You know what I'm saying? So here's a scripture that I, um, I posted the other day. It's Leviticus 26, 9 to 12. And it says this. For I will look on you, be favorably, and make you fruitful. Multiply you. This is, this is abundant life. Multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. The new is going to be so great, so amazing, you will want to clear out the old. That's what the scripture is saying. You're going, to, you're going to have to eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. And so in a season where God is stirring us to pray, and he's saying there's revival coming, whatever nation you're watching from, whatever church you belong to, whatever you do in this life, whether it's full-time ministry or in marketplace ministry, you're still in full-time, but you know what I mean, hopefully. we all called to ministry, but some people are business, some are church leaders, some are whatever you're called to do, that in this season, as we begin to clear out the old, there's more that God has for us. And the, when I say more, I'm talking about more of the presence of God. Because the very next line is, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, you know in Christ, this happened. But what I'm saying is in the season, God is saying, when you, when you begin to get a taste of the new, the grace of God, the favor of God, the increase of God, the abundant life, you're going to want to get the old out. That was Leviticus 26, 9 and 12. And there are a lot of you watching. You've been through really hard times. And God is saying, get the old out. Change the way of thinking, even the way you pray, your expectations. Go back to the old school simplicity of faith and believe that when I give you a promise, I'm able to fulfill my word to you. Somebody needs to hear that today. So you get the old out. And in the old is the disappointment of delay, the feeling irrelevant, the feeling frustrated, that I can't see God, I don't know what he's saying. That all belongs in the old season, and God's saying, when you get that out, you're going to experience the new. And remember, personal revival means God is going to restore, he's going to resurrect, he's going to heal, he's going to revive areas in your life where you lost expectation, where you lost a passion for his ways, and he's going to begin to stir and revive all those things again. So, there was a woman in 1 Samuel 1-2, and we're not going to look at that today, so don't turn if you've got a Bible. Um, her name was Hannah, and she was the one who was married to Elkanah, but he had another wife by the name of Penina. Now, Penina had children, but Hannah didn't. If you read 1 Samuel 1-2, it'll tell you this. Um, Penina had a whole lot of children, but Hannah didn't, and she wanted a child. She wanted a son. And she was the one who went into the temple and prayed, and the priest saw her and thought she had been drinking because she was praying, she was pouring out her heart before the Lord, and only her mouth was moving. And, um, you know, I, I heard the other day, maybe you've all known this already, but to me it was quite a revelation. The name of Hannah, the meaning of the name Hannah is grace. And I feel that in this season, God is giving us the grace to push through the opposition. We're not doing it in our own strength. And you know what Hannah's op opposition was? The other, the other wife of her husband, who was just giving birth to children all the time, and she kept pointing fingers at her and saying all kinds of things to her. And she, she made her feel terrible about herself, that nothing was ever going to change. And the devil's doing that with a lot of people in the season of revival and saying nothing is going to happen for you. And God by, is going to empower us by His Spirit and give us the grace to come to Him and to pour our hearts out before Him and say, God, I believe you want to give me more than I can see right now. I believe all the promises that you gave me about um, ministry and salvations and healing and breakthrough, I believe all these things and I come to you now and I believe that you're faithful to do it. It's because of his grace on our lives. So whenever I speak about prayer, I always remember Hannah, how she went into the temple and she was so downcast and so disappointed 
But she knew if she went before God and she poured out her heart, that there was some hope that God would hear her and her prayer would be answered. And that's exactly what happened. And so there's grace in the season for personal revival. There's grace on your life for the things that you've stopped praying about to go back to God and to say, God, I am coming before you again. I'm going to pick up those prophetic promises that I have. I'm going to start reminding you again. I'm going to start speaking those things again. I'm going to start praying again for my family members who've gone, they've derailed in their faith. And I've been praying for a long time. And here I am again, Lord. And I'm reminding you that you promised me that they would all come into the kingdom. You know, this kind of thing, if, you, if you're alert to what the Spirit of God is doing, whenever there's a revival, salvations are always involved, obviously. And so pick up those things again. Say, God, make me hungry for your presence. Give me the desire to pray. Um, give me a passion for prayer again and show me what to pray. The quickest way to get your passion back about prayer is to say, Holy Spirit, show me how to pray. Quickest way to personal revival. Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm hungry for the presence of God. Uh, when, whenever I feel as if I'm getting a little bit dry or a little bit you know, stagnant in my faith, because it's easy to prepare messages to preach to other people, but hearing God for myself, often I, I sit with God and I say, God, make me hungry again. And you know, come and reveal yourself to me again. And when we begin to see who God is again, we see him through fresh eyes. There's a revival that begins to take place. So this is, this is the abundant life that God wants us to live in. I said there's a remnant to, who are rising up who believe that abundant life is ours. It's not this life we hear about and see happening around us out there. It's more than, than we can see now. When it involves the kingdom, kingdom life is abundant life. And this is what I mean. There's, there's coming an increase in your life and a purpose in your life. God is wake, awakening prophetic people to be sharper in their hearing, to discern correctly, so important. And there's vision that's forming in, in the lives and the hearts of prophetic people in a season. Because prophetic people need to have vision. All believers do. But especially prophetic people and prophets, they have to have a vision and a purpose for why they are here. And so um, God is doing this again. So how do you know that you're on track with what God is doing? Maybe you feel frustrated. Maybe you feel challenged in your faith, but you're still willing. It's a big sign that you, you are right where God needs you to be. You still have the challenges. You might still feel a bit overwhelmed, but you're willing to carry on, okay? The devil hasn't got you down yet. He hasn't beaten you down yet and said, and you've given up and said, I can't do this. And also, you've had a taste of the new. There's something in your spirit that is bubbling up because you've tasted the new. You've seen the increase. You've experienced the favor of God. You've had breakthrough. You've seen deliverance. Maybe you're hearing miracles of healings and you know this is for you. You're trusting God for healing. And this is just a taste of what's to come. So there's something in your spirit that's come alive again. And recognize that this is you on track for your personal revival. Um, so there, um, let me just read you something. Um, there's, there's something about revival in our own lives that... Nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can come and say, oh, you're talking a whole lot of rubbish. Because when you're in the midst of a personal revival, you don't care what people say anyway. Because you've got that little taste of what's to come. You've had it. You've seen it. You've received it in your spirit. I always say this, that breakthrough always happens on the inside before it manifests on the outside, in the natural. And so you're right on track with God. And when in the middle of a challenge... You say, no, I still believe. I'm not going to give in to what the devil's trying to say to me. I'm not going to fall for this trap. I still believe. You know, the areas that the devil tries to, to get us caught up in, and I don't know if I can uh, remember this. I'll give it a try. It's not in my notes. Is that um, um, discouragement, obviously, distractions, and the other one is feeling diminished in your faith and your purpose. All those areas, the D's, distractions, discouragement, 
diminishment and there's another D that I cannot think of now, all lead you down a path to depression where you just want to give up. And, and people who are right on track with God or who are going to take these pointers that I've given you this afternoon are going to rise up above those things that the enemy is trying to put on your life because you have a purpose. And so these are some pointers to remember to be able to live your life believing you're in the midst of revival. I'm not waiting for revival to happen around me in the church to say there's a revival. I'm asking God for revival in my life so that I can be part of the big revival, the great revival, corporate revival he wants to send. So here's the first thing. Don't never apologize for what you believe. Um, when we live a life that's apologetic for about who we are, what we believe, then we diminish the greatness of God in our lives and and all these amazing things that God has for us, um, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose our passion about it. I'm just going to find a scripture here. I'm interrupting myself, but it's always a good thing when I'm interrupted. Um, so, um, um, okay, so never apologize for what you believe. And my example that I want to give to you today is Caleb and Joshua coming out of the promised land. I'm, I think I'll always have to refer to this whenever I preach a message these days because going into the promised land was the greatest answer to, to the greatest picture of the faithfulness of God to bring his people through the wilderness but yet these people didn't enter into the promised land. Remember this now. It's in Numbers chapter 14. So if we are people who are passionate about what we believe, we are fully convinced that God said there's revival coming. God is faithful to his promises. He's going to do what he said he was going to do. Then we will not apologize for what we believe. But there are some people who have the promises from God, but they're too afraid to say it to anybody else, to share it with anybody else, to live as though their prayers were already answered, because they're too concerned with what other people think, that they might think they're too radical, too stupid, too over the top, if they say, this is what God promised me. But we, as people of faith in the kingdom and faith in God, not faith in the kingdom, but we are people of the kingdom who have faith, and our faith is in God, we are not meant to apologize for what we believe. And I'm not just talking about people in the world who you're talking to. I'm talking about other Christians, that some people are even scared to share with other believers because they think, this is too big. This, this, you know, I'll wait for God to do it first. And so here we find the, the, the spies who went into the promised land, they had the promise of God, but when they saw the opposition, they, you know, they came out and they fell apart, apart from, apart from Joshua and Caleb. And it says here, um, the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. That was Numbers 14, 16 to 19. So are we people like Joshua and Caleb who are going to be willing to say what we see in the spiritual realm? I see revival. I see signs and wonders. This is what I see. I don't know about you. Healings, miracles, signs and wonders. And then if I say that, this is a season of signs and wonders, there will be one or two Christians who will say, but where are they? I don't see them. We have to get the victory on the inside before we get it on the outside. And when we get the victory on the inside, when we begin to say what God has shown us, this is a time of revival. This is a time of His glory being seen upon His people. There will be people who will laugh at you. And they'll say, oh, let's wait and see. And then there will be the tendency to sit back and say, okay, I'll wait till God says it, and then I'll say it. No, in this season, we have to be people who don't apologize for
for what we believe. I believe in the goodness of God. I believe in the grace of God. I believe God is going to use believers in ways we don't expect Him to use us. That God is going to be seen upon His church. His glory will be seen upon His church. I believe that because I've got that on the inside. So I'm not going to apologize for that. Other thing is, always have the word nevertheless in your vocabulary. The word nevertheless. And that comes from Luke 5 verse 4, where Jesus said to the disciples, to, to the fishermen at the time, launch out into the deep and let your nets out for, the cat, for a catch. And these guys had fished all night. I spoke about this not too long ago, but I've got to bring this in here because some of you weren't there in the, previous, in the session where I spoke about it. They've been fishing all night. They've been toiling all night and they caught nothing. And Jesus comes and he says, launch your nets out into the deep for a great catch. You know, you can, and Peter said, but we've, we've, we've toiled all night and we caught nothing. But then he said, nevertheless, at your word. And when, he, when they did that, he, they saw this great catch. They had to call out the, all the other boats and call their partners in, the other boats in, to get this catch in because it was too big just for one fishing boat. And so God will come along and give you an instruction. Remember I said in this season God is stirring us to pray. And one of the reasons he's stirring us to pray is so when we pray, when we are people who pray, we become more sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit of God. Because our prayer life keeps us in communication with the heart of the Father. Our prayer life is not just taking our requests to Him, telling Him what we need, or just saying, I love you, Lord, and that's it. When we pray, our fellowship with God keeps us connected to the heart of the Father, and the Spirit of God is actively involved in what we're saying and what we're hearing. That's why prayer is important. And so the Holy Spirit is going to give us instructions that we need to hear and obey to stay in the place of favor. And so this instruction didn't make sense in the natural realm, and this is going to happen with a lot of you. It's not going to make sense in the natural realm, but because you've developed your lifestyle of prayer and staying connected to God, you're going to recognize this is the Spirit of God, and you're going to say, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care that I've worked hard for two weeks and I've got no results. I'm going to do what the Spirit of God is prompting me to do. Nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. And we are going to see great things happen. Now I've got one more scripture to read to you. Um, and then I will greet some of you. If you're still hanging around here. I see a lot of you have. And this is from Joshua chapter 14. There are many people who feel that they become irrelevant in this season. Because they've been around for a long time. They've seen God move. They've read the books. They've written the books. They've got the t-shirt and they're wearing it kind of thing. And then we see a different generation coming along and also different ways that people are doing things. And, and God is connecting people all over the place and he's raising up people and doing a lot of things in the kingdom, in, his, in the body of Christ at this time. And then the people who feel that they're not relevant anymore may just be in a place where they say, I'm just, you know, I'm too tired now. I've trusted God for so long. If God wants to send revival, then okay. I'll be part of it, but, you know, I'll just have a little part to play. I'll just, you know, sit back and wait for it. And this is not the right time to be thinking that. You know, it's time to retire. I've been doing this thing for 60 years. Not me. Um, it's not time to retire in your faith. To put your faith out to pasture. you know, Leave it out there and let everybody else do the stuff. Because they seem to have the goods. There's something in your life that God sees that is very necessary in the season as we're preparing for revival. This, this is why he wants you to have a personal revival. So you'll be one of these people saying, yes, I have been around for decades. I have seen God move. It's been a while since I've seen this and heard this. But I'm ready for what's to come now. And this is the language of people who are in the middle of personal revival. They haven't given up. And so here we find Caleb, Joshua 14, um, in, from verse 7. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, here's the word nevertheless, 
My brethren, but a negative nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And that word holy is not holy. You know, Christians are holy. It means fully. He gave his all to follow the Lord my God. And that's attitude. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 45 years earlier, which means he's now 85. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. Now, this has got nothing to do with your age. This doesn't only apply to people who are 85 or even 40 years old. It doesn't matter how old you've been you are or how long you've been around in the kingdom. This is an attitude of heart that we need in this season. He says this in verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. And then he says, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. He's saying, give me my inheritance. I have got the promise when I was this old, and today I'm still standing in faith. I'm still in the same place. I still have the physical strength to go out there and fight a war, but I still have the spiritual strength to stand here and say, now, Give me my inheritance. I haven't given up. And so this is something that God does in the middle of a personal revival. He begins to remind us of the promises that he gave us. He begins to remind us of things that he had done before. And he begins to remind us of who we are in him and the, the authority we have in the name of Jesus. And we stand in this place now, maybe feeling tired, maybe feeling challenged, and we say, God, I still, I believe you have an inheritance for me that I haven't even tasted yet. I've had a little taste of something, but I haven't received a full inheritance. Now, Rory and I have been in ministry for, say, say 33 years. I think it's 33. For a few years before that, we were already involved in some things. But in the season now, even though we had fantastic promises, a lot of them have come to pass, but going to nations, doing prophetic schools, raising up spiritual sons and daughters, connecting with people, and all kinds of great things. Some of those things haven't happened. A lot of them have. But even though we have all of those things, we still feel as if we're in the starting blocks because we know, both of us know, there's something greater coming. And everything we've been through in these decades has been to prepare us for where God is taking us now. And so don't be sitting back saying, oh, I feel like I'm 185 years old in the spirit because the battles have been so hard. God wants to give you a personal revival so you will be one of these people, the remnants I call us, saying, God, we're ready for our inheritance. We are ready to take what the ground that you have promised the body of Christ. There's a promised land out there that's called revival, miracles, signs and wonders, breakthrough, restoration, salvations, all of these things are the promised land that you and I have to go and occupy. Every place in which the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given it to you. So this is the Caleb mindset that we need to have. He was 85 years old. I, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, people in the natural who, my mother is turning 91 in February, and she's still going strong. Struggling a bit with her hearing, still going strong. And so you and I, as believers in the kingdom, this is our time to say, God, we want our inheritance. Not to be demanding something from God, but to see the signs and wonders, to see the revival that we're hearing about. And we want to be part of it. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for people who joined in. Almery Waltman, Lisa Spagnuolo. I'm going to mention some names. Brenda Hutting, Belinda Dehan. Um, Karen Swanepoel, Renee Ibe, uh, Corin Dupree, Vanessa Saliers, Marianne Anderson, um, Ramesh, Pastor Ramesh, um, Cynthia Boyson. If you're also here, Evangelist Chin Yerere, uh, Colleen Lawrence, Joey Hrunewald. Diane Santiago, Sohail Yunus, 
And there's a reason I'm mentioning your names here. Janine von Skalkweg, Christopher Doran, Maria Bowen, Lamise Bailey, um, um, and, um, Cheryl Cheryl, Chequanda, Fortunate Debbie, Wellman Minter, Jennifer Gallard, um, and I know there were Hale um, Mariette Wright, Maria Bowen, Priscilla Kwan, Sarah Ray Hughes, Megan Hope, and other names that I'm sorry if I missed you out, but all of us are called for this season to re have a personal revival, a personal restoration, resurrection, re-energizing, rejuvenation of our faith in these days so we can be on track and we can be the people who say, Lord, we're ready for that inheritance, the inheritance that belongs to the body of Christ, where we see God's kingdom come in the areas that he's called us to be. And so, Lord, I pray for those Holy Spirit promptings that people will be obedient and sensitive to the Spirit of God leading us and guiding us so we can be in that river of favor in this season, in the name of Jesus. So thank you so much for joining me today. I will go and look at your comments in a while. And I'm so blessed that you gave up some of your Tuesday afternoon to be with me in Cape Town. It's a fantastic sunny Tuesday. And um, I pray for you, you will have a fantastic spiritual weather day, wherever you are. <laughs> so thanks for joining me, and I'll see you soon again. Lots of love. Bye. Thanks for joining today's session. I hope you were equipped, empowered, and encouraged today by what you heard. Remember, you can find all the live video sessions that you may have missed on this page, on the Facebook page, Kathy Mole Ministries, or on YouTube, Kathy Mole on YouTube. You can also find all the other resources on kathymole.com.